What is going on, everybody? It's the Fox, and we are for AEW Rampage and SmackDown Review for March the 11, 2022. A little program note for next week's um reviews. There will be no Rampage review because Rampage will be going on at about 11.30 or whenever they have their, match, their shows. They're, um, the NCAA basketball tournament um, games are over with on TBS next Friday night. So I'm just going to do a SmackDown review. Rampage will be something I watch at my leisure. But... And I honestly don't think Tony Khan and them are going to book a show, really, that anybody should want to see for that reason. I mean, there's no reason to give us a big show like they did somewhat tonight with the debut of Isaiah, of, I want to say Isaiah Swerve's God, but it's changed to Strickland. Jamie Hader versus Mercedes Martinez, Darby Allen versus Mark Quinn, and Keith Lee versus QT Marshall. So... Before we get into the show tonight, I'll talk about the WWE news when we get the SmackDown because there were two big things coming out of WWE tonight. One very bad in a medical reason and one that was very bad in dumb creative reason. We'll get to that when we do. But people have, wondering, have been wondering since w, since, eight, since Ring of Honor shut down and released all the contracts, when are we going to get Jay and Mark Briscoe into AEW? Are we going to get them to come and take on FTR and have all these matches we want to see? The answer is absolutely not. Obviously, one of the Briscoes, I think it was Jay, came out, I think last year or the year before that, with some homophobic tweets on social media. Or, and got him in some hot water. I don't know this because I, I don't really follow the Briscoes or Ring of Honor and anything at that time, so I don't know anything about any of this. But apparently, a higher up member of the Warner Media family does not want the Briscoes in all elite wrestling. So, anybody looking to see the Briscoes versus the Hardys, or Briscoes versus FTR, or Briscoes versus Jurassic Express, or Briscoes versus the um, Lucha Bros, you're gonna have to see that on the independent circus. Circuit or Terminus or GCW or something like that. It will not happen in all elite wrestling. I, again, don't know anything that happened I, with Jay, with the Briscoes when it comes to all this um, controversial stuff. Apparently, they apologized in, on, at, at an indie event in front of fans, which honestly, in my opinion, I think that's good enough. Have they gone out there and actually apologized in front of their peers, in front of a crowd of fans? That's good enough for me. But you know what? I, I don't make the decisions in AEW. I don't make the decisions for Warner Media. My biggest question is, if that was the feeling of Warner Media, why did that, Tony Khan send FTR to even have a chance to, um, to tease a match between FTR and the Briscoes? Now, also, this also probably means after, um, final, after Supercard of Honor in April... That the Briscoes are probably going to lose the tag team titles to whoever they're going to face, which will probably be somebody. That might be where you get FTR versus the Briscoes. If you're going to get the Briscoes in a match against FTR, it probably will be at Supercard of Honor. FTR will beat them for the tag team titles. I don't know if it's actually... I think it's an open challenge match, though. But it would be FTR versus the Briscoes. The Briscoes will win, and that'll be it. I mean, FTR will win, and then the Briscoes' affiliation with Ring of Honor will be severed forever. They will go to the Hall of Fame. They will do whatever they want with them. But that, that is going to be all. They will see. So anybody ever like holding out hope that the Briscoes will be in Ring of uh, in AEW in the near future? You're just gonna have to put that to the side. It just isn't okay. So it has been announced, and I guess I I just I just went on to the um, Super Carnivano Wikipedia page. I don't know if this is actually true or not, but. It does label the Briscoes versus FTR for the Ring of Honor tag team title. So obviously, with Tony Khan buying Ring of Honor and Tony Khan having FTR under contract, then FTR is winning the Ring of Honor tag team titles. And they will be the first champions under the Tony Khan era of this show. So that is what you got. Also on that show, John Gresh and Bandito will be taking on each other in a unification match for the, Ring of Honor, for the Undisputed Ring of Honor Championship. Swerve the Realist, Swerve the Realist versus Alex Zane, Joe Hendry versus somebody I don't know yet. AEW, please sign Joe Hendry. He is absolutely awesome. And Ninja Mag versus To Be Determined. Those are your five matches for a Super Card of Honor. I will probably look up into seeing this. This is April 1st, which of course is 
Friday? Right? It is a Friday. That's going to make it really hard with SmackDown. And it's, we'll, we'll see what happens. I might watch it on Saturday and give you a review Saturday afternoon before WrestleMania. I'm not watching TakeOver. Oh, I'm sorry. <coughs> NXT Stand and Deliver. I have no desire to see that show. But, yes. The Briscoes. If you want to see FTR versus the Briscoes, you got to watch out. Watch Supercard of Honor because you're not going to get it in All Elite Wrestling or Ring of Honor after that. We started the show off with Darby Allen versus Mark Quinn. This match is is continuation of what happened on Sunday and what happened on Tuesday, on Wednesday, with the trios match and then this Matt Hardy getting beat down by the Andrade family office, the AFO. Can you please come up with a better name? And Darby Allen staying standing up for Matt Hardy on Wednesday. Jeff Hardy making his return after dancing his way down to the ring before saving his brother, and all of that in a bag of chips. Hmm. Good match between these two guys. Um, I don't know why they just, just didn't just make it a tag team match. I mean, yeah, Sting probably still recovering from three days because this was taped on Wednesday. Three days after diving off of a balcony, you still could have just made it private party versus Sting and Darby. I think that would have just been, I think everyone would have been fine with that. Darby could have wrestled the majority of the match. Sting comes in, gets a couple punches, tags Darby back in and all that. That would have been fine. But they went with the singles match. That's fine, whatever. Allen's gains control early on and sends Quinn to the outside where Cassidy helps Quinn get in control. Back from break, Allen hits a superplex for a near fall. Quinn hits a backflip flatline on his, for his own near fall. Allen knocks in the future on Umbar for a, for a victory submission. Match was okay, nothing special here. After the match, um, the AFO come out. They look like they're about ready to come down. It's going to be a two on whatever you want to go with. And they come to the ring. But here come the Hardy Boys. And the AFO just, instead of going into the ring, they just walk around the ring. Because even though it would still be an unfair advantage for Hardy, Sting, the Hardys, Sting, and Allen, they decide they're just going to walk around the ring because they know the Hardys mean business. Something to look out for with this is that while this is going on, the Hardys are there. Darby Allen is just on his hands and knees, just staring a hole. Through Jeff Hardy. He is focused that this guy right here is the next guy I want to take on. I had a match against CM Punk in his first debut match. I want to have CM. I want to have Jeff Hardy's debut match. That's what it looks like they're going with. I don't know if it's going to be Hardy's debut match or not. Maybe his debut singles match. I don't know. But you can clear this day. They tease it on Wednesday. They're teasing it tonight. Well, Darby's teasing it, if anything. He wants some of Jeff Nero Hardy. Why? Because when Darby Allen does what he does, a lot of people compare him to a mixture, and I've done this too. He looked like a mixture of Sting and Jeff Hardy. Sting with the black and white face paint. I know Jeff does face paint too, but his is usually multicolor. Sting's is, of course, black and white, unless on occasion he has a little bit of red in there or something else. And Jeff Hardy for his death defying attack, um, offense. So, yeah, Sting, I, I, I could see the Hardys versus Sting and Darby, Sting versus Jeff Hardy, like Sting, not Sting versus Jeff Hardy, but Darby Allen versus Jeff Hardy, I can see that as well, and there's a lot that we can see coming forward. We get a backstage promo with new TNT champion squad of the sky, pretty much saying that he's not going to lose the title on Wednesday, and Warlow is just going to be another victim of his unbeaten strength, and click and go away. The only thing I can see happening on Wednesday night is that these like Squidlow's gonna beat the shit out of this guy. He's gonna make he's like Scorpio Sky is gonna win this match or keep the championship by the skin of his teeth because Sean Spears and MJF are going to knock are going to screw him over. I can see Sean Spears hitting Wardlow while the referee is distracted in the back with the chair. He no sells it. Sean, he goes out to Sean Spears, the ref, um, MJF gets the diamond ring and punches him in the face and leaves him for Scorpio's got to win. Someone, I believe, I, I don't remember, I think it was, I don't remember why I heard, was where I read this from. I think I actually heard it on Solar Monsters um, review or something. It was like someone came up to, with an idea that MJF could come out and be like, Hey, Warlong, I, I, I see the air of my ways. I'll give you your release. With a 90-day no-compete clause. Not saying that he can't be on television. Actually, I think it was on Brian Alvarez. My bad. I think it was my Brian Alvarez. Someone told this to Brian Alvarez. But, like, a 90-day no-compete clause. Meaning he can't wrestle 
for 90 days. And you got yourself all of this month, all of next month to get us to, revel to um, double or nothing. This, of course, cancels the um, TNT Championship match. Then um, Scorpius Guy says, oh, no, 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 no. I'm here to wrestle a match. So I want anybody in the back to come out here and take me on for the TNT title. Obviously, the Women's Championship match is probably going to be the main event because it's in Thunder Rosa's hometown. They have somebody come out, like maybe a Wheeler Yuta, maybe a Brian Pillman Jr. or Griff Garrison, one of those guys. And Scorpius Guy beats them. And then you move on. But MJF can gloat about the fact that he's got this 90 days over Wardlow's head and Wardlow can't wrestle on AEW television or anywhere else until the 90 days is up. And of course, this could also lead to Wardlow, you know, wanting to wreak havoc on uh, make MJF's life a living hell, find him in his hotel room, not fighting, he knows where, M where MJF lives, going to his house to beat the shit out of him until he waves the 90 days no compete clause. He could do what CM Punk did when MJF comes out to have a match with like a Sean Dean or something. He comes out and he attacks the opponent of um, MJF causing a disqualification, which I know would be a little repetitive, but that's what AEW is doing with the Women's Championship, so let's not go there. And then, well, and then when we get close to the double or nothing, we're not we're not to the ninety days yet. We're not to the ninety days. That would be if it's the sixteenth. That would be June sixteenth. Would be ninety days. June sixteenth would be ninety days. So we get close to the double or nothing, and MJF's like, you know what? You know what, MJF? I'm, I'm tired of this. You're making my life a living hell. Here's what we're gonna do. I want a match with you. Want a match? You want this this ninety day this ninety day no compete clause? Wait, right? Well, fine. At double or nothing, in a match, the course that MJF could put all the um, all the stipulations that he can. Like he can use weapons, but Wardlow can't. Wardlow has to have one arm tied behind his back. Whatever. And if Wardlow beats him at double or nothing, his ninety days is is um, waived, and they would go their separate ways, never to never to, never to interact again. So. Wardlow, of course, wins a double or nothing after Chicanery, the Pinnacle who had left, get involved still. But he fights all of it off, beats him with a one arm power bomb two, three times, and that is that. Will it bury MJF? I don't think so, but they're going to have to do something. I just don't see what, um, Scorpio Sky losing the championship a week after winning it. It just doesn't make any sense. I can see why they took they took the title off of um, Sammy Guevara, which apparently they've been planning this for six months, including everything that happened with Cody. The only thing that delayed it apparently was Cody getting sick with COVID, and happened to delay to the ladder match, which was a blessing in disguise because that ladder match was definitely a damn good match. It was a nice send off for Cody, who's going back to WWE, probably going to show up in Jacksonville on Monday, which would be the just a piece of resistance in WWE's mind, bringing Cody Rhodes in in Jacksonville, of all places. Jamie Hader versus Mercedes Martinez. I couldn't care, give a shit about this match. I know people want to see this match, but I don't care. Jamie Hader won because of distraction by Rebel and the Women's Champion. And it's like, where is Thunder Rosa? Where was Mercedes Martinez on, when, on Sunday? Oh, and after the match, they're about ready to destroy Mercedes Martinez. And now Thunder Rosa comes out. Where the fuck? I don't mean she had to be in Mercedes Martinez's control corner. She could have been on commentary the entire match. But no. They let her sit in the back, probably chit chat with Tony Khan about this coming week's um, match and everything and how the weather is and everything. Oh, no, there's your cue. Go take a chair and run. Terrible, terrible, terrible booking. There was no fucking reason. Like, this, this, this shit is just getting just old. The fact that you're going to have, and it, of course it was Rick Knox of all referees, the dumbest referee in all of AEW, who might, it, it's just, I guess Tony Khan just really loves booking women's wrestling like shit. Shit booking on Wednesday, shit booking on Sunday, shit booking tonight. Oh, so we can have a big hometown moment in AEW for Thunder Rosa. And some jack off online on social media wanted to say that it's going to be a big moment for it for Thunder Rosa, and more people are going to watch that show, watch the Wednesday night show, than they did than people who bought the pay per view. Oh, really? Now, did you see the buy rate for the pay per view? One hundred and forty thousand to one hundred and fifty, one hundred and seventy thousand buys. Yeah, that's pretty big. 
I, 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 and you don't realize that there were, that doesn't count the theaters. That doesn't count how many people came. Like when you buy a pay per view, it's not just usually when you like. If you have a like a party for a pay per view, it's not usually just one person. It's usually two, three, four, five people. There's probably more people who watch Revolution that are gonna watch um, AEW for the next month, every week. They don't give me this shit that it's justifiable how shitty they booked that women's championship match on Sunday. If you were going to do the match on her in her hometown, not on her birthday, Brian Alvarez. Her birthday is in like June or July. Thank you very much. But in her hometown, inside a steel cage, don't book the match at the pay-per-view. You take away everything and it makes absolutely no sense to have her lose on Sunday... And then automatically get a number one contenders match on Wednesday. Have a bad match because, I don't know, her Layla Hirsch looks like she's injured. Thunder Rosa looks like she's injured as well. So we can have a cage match next week. None of it makes any fucking sense. And then you put this match, which everybody, a lot of people wanted to see Jamie Hayden versus Mercedes Martinez. Better to have it live than taped, in my opinion, but that's not what they did. And you do the same shit. Again, and again, and again. Yeah, it's going to be a cage match. Has that stopped other people from getting involved in a cage match? Fuck no. Oh, but what about the tag team title match? Brandon Cutler threw a fucking bag with a spike, with a thumbtack thumb riddle shoes in it. So yes, somebody still got involved. Did it out and, like change the outcome of the match? No. But still, there are ways for, Ms. for Jamie Hayter and Rebel to get involved. And I can see it happening. And then when we go from there, what's going to happen after? Oh, the, the, the faker will still be on TV bitching and moaning and whining and complaining because she lost her championship. She should be the women's champion. She's the face of the company, which you haven't been the face of the company ever. She has never been the face of the women's division, no matter how much they want to fucking push her. Thunder Rosa, the minute she signed her contract and it said Thunder Rosa is all elite, she's been the face of the division ever since, whether she's champion or not. If you can claim to be face of the women's division before you won that championship, so can Thunder Rosa. She's more over than you. She's better than you in the ring. She's more popular with the fans. You ain't got shit. You need to go to your fucking doctor's office and be the best dentist you can be and stay on the arm of your fucking boyfriend because that's all you're going to be known for when it's all said and done. You stupid, stupid little bitch. Get the fuck off my TV. Shut your fucking mouth and just be Adam Cole's girlfriend like you should always have been. Moving on. So... Let's see here. Backstage comments from Ricardo say that she asked if Dean missed her. She said she's been thinking about revenge when Dean's attack. And put her out her action. She said, this time, I will cut off your head. Getting a little dark there, aren't you, Shida? I mean, it is, she is Japanese, and they get dark a lot. Keith Lee versus QT Marshall. Powerhouse Hobbs has joined the rest of the gang on commentary. Headbutt to start the match. Pretty much, this was a one-sided. This was a one-sided ass-kicking contest. QT Marshall did try for a diamond cutter. He went nowhere. He got the big bang catastrophe. One, two, three. And after the match, oh, buddy, um, the dude, um, Aaron Solo just doesn't learn. He got his ass beat. Nick Camarato came in. They had a little bit of a fight. Um, Keith Lee, it's a nasty, mass, massive powerbomb to Nick Camarato. And that was that for them. Here comes Team Taz. They fight for a bit. Mickey Starks gets taken out. Keith Lee gets hit with a massive powerbomb by Powerhouse Hobbs. I will have to give him up to that. It's not a powerbomb, a spinebuster. My bad. Double A spinebuster-esque. Spinebuster. My God. What a spinebuster. And Keith Lee is left lying by Team Taz. So, obviously, Team Taz and Keith Lee are not done yet. It is time for the main event, as it's Isaiah, I keep saying Isaiah Swerve Scott, he hasn't been Isaiah, he's a Swerve Strickland, they aren't even using his first name, Shane Swerve Strickland, he's just Swerve Strickland, but before we get to that, we do have our St. Patrick's Day Slam card, the Women's Championship match in the cage, Scorpio Sky vs. Wardlow, Hangman Anna Page, and Tag Team Champions Jungle Boy and Jurassic Express, um, and, Luchas and Luchasaurus vs. Hangman Anna Page, Hang Adam Cole, my bad, Adam Cole and Red Dragon by Fish and Kyle O'Reilly, and just signed, Brian Danielson and John Moxley versus Chuck Taylor and Wheeler Yuta. Um, Trent Beretta must be injured or something. I don't know why he's not in this match, but okay. 
Man, Man Page will air at a special time next Friday, starting from full coverage at the NCAA tournament at approximately 11.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Could be a little bit earlier than that, but I'm not going to wait around. I'm just going to get my review for SmackDown out of the way. Skip Rampage this week. I'll watch it, and depending on what's going on, I don't. I honestly don't see a reason for for Tony Khan to book anything major. Because honestly, I would put a replay on Saturday. I really would. I would have just. I, I know you can't move it to Saturday because the NCAA tournament. I I don't know. They're kind of they're kind of in a bind here because the NCAA tournament's um first round starts from it goes Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. I think it's like that for the first two weeks. So, oh, I don't know. If anything, I would have just put the show put the show on Cartoon Network or something. You have it is Warner Media. They could move the show around. I would move it to a different channel that isn't airing NCAA football, NCAA basketball. That's just me. After Strickland's in ring AEW debut, obviously, like they, they, like Tony Nese and them having this match, and Tony Nese brought up them having history on Fridays. Of course, that means uh, two hundred five live. The dead brand that no longer exists with NXT Level Up happening now, which nobody cares about as well. They had themselves a pretty good match here. Swerve is over with the crowd. I have not seen a, a Swerve Strickland match or any type of Swerve match in at all. I did not. I was I, I checked out of NXT. I think he was in the breakout tournament, the original breakout tournament. I missed that match. But, like, yeah, I missed his entire time in NXT. I checked out of NXT before he really came up. Because it, I could just see, I saw the writing on the wall way before most people did, and I just said, "Fuck this shit! I am not watching. I am not watching Vince McMahon slowly destroy Vin Triple H's vision of NXT." So I was like, "Nah, I'm just gonna skip." But I hear it was really good. This was a pretty decent match here. 450 splash from Tony Nice for a two count. Nice starts so drawing and Strickland gets caught with a boot. Nice goes up for a pump handle, but Nice ex um he escapes. Strickland gets his own reversal and hits a double stomp on Nice. Strickland follows up with a near fall. Strickland kicks Nice in the head and leaps to the top rope. Strickland hits a double stomp, which did not look pretty at all. I think he missed a little bit. One, two, three, and that was that. Tony Nice falls to Swerve Strickland, losing his first match in the year of 2022. The biggest question coming for Tony Nice now is what is next for this guy? Obviously, they already have a feud with a guy. Like, they just signed Keith Lee a couple weeks ago, and he's, getting, he's already in a feud with Team Taz. This looking to be back to Jay Lethal. Jay Lethal signed at full gear and has had maybe a match or two. He's wrestled for the FDW title once and hasn't really been on regular television. He's been on Dark and Dark Elevation most of his, his time in AEW. I know with Ring of Honor being bought and everything, maybe he goes to Ring of Honor and runs that. I don't know. We'll just have to wait and see. So we come over to SmackDown. Where uh, Roman Reigns was not on the show, so you know there's already a down couple points on that. Brock Lesnar was here, was the best part of the show. Pac McAfee beats the living shit out of Austin Theory towards the, before the main event, which was fucking awesome. Austin Theory had had it coming, but unfortunately that meant Pat McAfee had to be removed from the building, which makes me think that Pat McAfee is not long for his time on SmackDown, and his match at WrestleMania might be his last his last show. For WWE, it's just they it, like it. Just feels like that might be where they go. They might they might take him off commentary for this like from now until WrestleMania, and have somebody else fill in for him. Maybe a Corey Graves. Maybe they bring Tom Phillips. Um, some not Tom Phillips, but uh, who the fuck? Uh, I wouldn't say uh, Wade Barrett up. He's the he does the same thing as Michael Cole, the other guy. Fuck, I can't remember his name. The um other guy in NXT. But they might bring him up and have him take the spot and have Mike, have Pat McAfee just been here for one fucking year. And man, if that's the case, what a year it was. But man, SmackDown will suffer without Pat McAfee. I'm just telling you that right now. Pete Dunne makes his, eight, his SmackDown main roster debut. Known. He's not, Pat Mac, he's not Pete Dunne anymore. He's Butch. That's right. They changed Pete Dunne's name to Butch. Just like Piper Niven, just like Chad Gable, this will be the only time I mention this name. He is Pete Dunn, and so I say so, he is Pete fucking Dunn. No, I will never call Walter Gunther, I will never call Piper Niven that derogatory name, I would never call, I never called 
Chad Gable, Shorty G, or anything like that. It's fucking Pete Dunne. It will always be Pete Dunne. I don't give a shit what Vince McMahon wants to gain. And I will, face, I will give sentiment to anybody else who said this. Fuck Vince McMahon. Fuck Bruce Pritchard and everybody who kisses their ass because Pete Dunne did not need to have his name changed. And on this channel, he will always be known as Pete fucking Dunne. I remember seeing Pete Dunne in What Culture Pro Wrestling when Eric Bischoff stood in the middle of that ring and said, Ladies and gentlemen, here is Pete Dunne. The guy is fucking awesome. They had him dressed just like Sheamus. And honestly... They did a backstage segment after the Brock Lesnar thing. And he introduced Pete Dunne. And Pete Dunne comes walking in and you saw Pete Dunne's face and you could see he didn't even want to be here. He had the look of, I'm here just to get a paycheck. I don't even want to do this, but I'm doing it because they're having me do it. Pete Dunne will be future endeavored after WrestleMania. You can count on it. Him, Apollo Crews, Zia Lee, Shanti Blackheart are all going to be featured endeavored for budget cuts after WrestleMania. They need all hands on deck for WrestleMania, but after that, it's anyone, anyone, anything goes, anytime. Pete Dunne is gone long for WWE. You killed him in 10 seconds. The second he walked into that screen and he walked away, his career on the main roster was dead. Typical WWE. Again, fuck Vince McMahon and fuck Bruce Pritchard and anybody who kisses their ass. But before we got to that, we had Brock Lesnar. And the other news we'll talk about when we get to the match and everything that involves it. But we see what happened with Brock Lesnar and Roman Reigns at, the, at Madison Square Garden because they're going to milk that as much as they can. Well, Brock Lesnar comes to the ring, the biggest pop in, uh, in all of the nights. You have Drew McIntyre, you have Ricochet as the Intercontinental Champion, and Brock Lesnar is the biggest, over, most over guy in the company, and that is sad. I mean, I couldn't, I, again, 10 years ago, when, uh, like 10 years ago, when Brock Lesnar made his return, and Brock Lesnar started being that heel person he always was, if you would have told me 10 years later Brock Lesnar would be the most over babyface and one of the best parts of Monday Night Raw was SmackDown, I would have looked you in the face and said, you're fucking lying. What drugs are you taking because you're fucking lying? And this guy, it's going to be sad because he did retire. He did come out on a radio show and say after he dropped the title to Drew McIntyre in 2020, he retired. He was done. His contract was up. His, he felt his career came full circle. He had his first wrestling match in front of nobody in a soda in a empty warehouse to have his final match in an empty warehouse it felt like to him full circle but of course what brought him back cha ching and that's why we have this Brock Lesnar we have right now so he comes to the ring he takes a mic he soaks it in for a minute and, you know just you can see he is not in a happy mood he calls out Roman Reigns he's like Roman Reigns get your ass out here you done changed the rules, boy, and changed the game. The last six nights, he's pulled his ass out of bed, looked in the mirror, shows us the shine in his eye, and tells Reigns to get a look, good look at it. He says, you don't draw first blood on Brock Lesnar. Live to tell about it, so Reigns has to change the rules. Lesnar says he's here for blood tonight, and he doesn't care what about WrestleMania contracts or WWE titles. He has tossed his cowboy hat jacket and the title towards Pat McAfee. I hope Pat McAfee caught that thing. He starts screaming for Reigns to come out. He says... Reigns screwed up and he wants Reigns blood, blood for blood. Heyman comes out for the stage and fans boo. Heyman tells them to stop booing. He says, if Lesnar's never listened in before, listen now because Lesnar got bled by the bloodline, smashed by the tribal chief. He points to the entrance ring and says, the tribal chief, Roman Reigns, is not here tonight. The boos get louder. Heyman paces, um, Lesnar paces around the ring. Heyman starts talking about how he knows Lesnar well than anyone else. Tells him to shut up and says, hey, if what's coming out of your fat jaw is true, then who is here to protect you? So he gets out of the ring. Lesnar comes out of the ring. He starts running after Paul Heyman. Paul Heyman is... Out of here as fast as he can be. He runs past a bunch of security. Tells him to stop him. Heyman goes after him. And keeps running out. But Heyman hops in an SUV and speeds away as Lesnar sees and is pissed off. 
So, again, I'm loving the Brock Lesnar, how Brock, like, Brock Lesnar's character. This is the best Brock Lesnar I have ever seen. Again, I did not see Brock Lesnar 20 years ago when he was in WWE and was the bet next big thing and all that stuff. I was not into, I didn't grab back into wrestling because of where I was at from the time WCW came, um, closed to 2003 was in a place where we didn't get cable. We got Channel 7, Channel 9, and that was it. So I didn't get... And internet wasn't what it is today. And by that time, nobody was really talking about wrestling anymore at school. It kind of just, like, you know, drift, drifted away from the mind for, you know, about two years. So, yeah. So I missed out of all the thing Brock Lesnar. I missed out of the invasion. Unfortunately, I watched it in twenty. I watched it in twenty fourteen when it was or twenty fourteen or fifteen when they put it on the network. That was a low waste of time. But anyway, from two thousand twelve to now, this is the best Brock Lesnar I have ever seen. So after that, we come back to show us how Rich Holland and Sheamus destroyed Kofi Kingston and Biggie's four wheeler last week. Mega Moran is backstage with Sheamus Holland. Asking why they destroyed the quad and they changed it to tonight's tag team match. Seamus joked about improving the quad because that's what they do. They made it a, a more aerodynamic and everything. He says tonight will be a proper fight night. Moran asked if that's what they brought the sledgehammer. Seamus is going about how they brought someone better than them. Some, someone dangerous. This person, they, we know. We know this guy by a different name, but they know him by that name. Pete Dunne suddenly appears with a new look. He looks just like Seamus. Uh, when Seamus has his, you know, white shirt on, suspenders and everything, and he has the look of, man, why the fuck did I re-sign with this company? Why the fuck are they changing who the fuck I am? And he just, he, he comes in, he has this look of, fuck this company, and walks out, and head, they head to the ring. So it's Big E, Kofi Kingston versus Seamus and Rich Holland. Unfortunately, this is also part of the news that happened tonight. And this is bad news. There was a spot in this match where Rich Holland on the outside had Big E in a belly to belly. He threw him over him. Didn't get enough lift. And Big E landed on his head. Big E has broken his neck. Big E on social media later on said that he has all feeling in his digits and everything. But he got his neck broken. So basically he probably had the Stone Cold Steve Austin type neck injury where... After, after a bit, he was able to feel everything, but his neck is not in one place. It's not in one piece anymore. So, the, I'm going to say this now. The New Day is fucking cursed, man. It's like, Biggie gets injured for a bit. Xavier Woods and them are like, Biggie comes back. Xavier Woods goes down. Kofi Kingston, I think, is the only guy in the New Day. Well, no, he, no, the only injury Kofi Kingston's really had was a storyline injury, so he could go home. Be on maternity leave for his new baby boy being born. I think it was boy. But yeah, like Biggie and Xavier Woods are fucking cursed of the new day. They just can't stay healthy. Now I don't blame Biggie on this. Rich Holland should have been like been able to get more strength up and be able to get him over. If you can't do a fucking belly to belly, turn him around and do a belly to uh, do a German suplex. At least you'll have a chance to land him on his shoulders, not his head. So. Basically, they, they, they rushed the match after that. Bro kick off the Kofi. Tony Mr. X Kofi in the middle of the ring. One, two, three. After the match, they beat him up as Biggie is being attended to. Um, pay, um, Pete Dunne comes to the ring. He starts beating the shit out of him, unloading. The referees try to stop him. Sheamus and Holland pull him off, pose together, but he goes back to start pounding him. Sheamus' music starts back up, and the trio pose together as, as Pete Dunne just looks down at Kofi Kingston like, I'm going to kick you. I'm going to get you next time. They better pull me off this time, but I'm going to kill you next time. Was it necessary to change his, theme, his change his name? Why? Why are you giving... It's like, Vince McMahon, probably... I'm like, and, and, and the jokes were flying. Like People are like, somebody going to tell WWE what this, what this name actually means? Someone had a picture of all these articles and stuff about Butch standing is something for a lesbian. And some people are like, well, well, Pete Dunne was being made fun of all the time. Maybe he got tired of hearing his name being... No, motherfuckers. This was a Vince McMahon and Bruce Pritchard production. This is what they do. They take guys who don't need anything done to them and kill them. Because it's a triple... Like, Pete Dunne is a Triple H guy. Pete Dunne is a Triple H project. Pete Dunne was somebody that Triple H gave such high praise for... That he gave him the longest reign of the NXT UK Championship till I believe Walter beat it uh, a year or so, like a couple months after or so. 
but he had the longest, the second, cha- the champion, second championship reign in the NXT UK title lineage. Had that great tournament, only to be thwarted by, um, shit. We went in there. Tyler Bates won it eventually, and in, in a classic NXT takeover Chicago with Mauro Ronaldo on commentary. That was a damn good match. Held it for over a year, lost it to Walter, and then came to NXT, won the tag team titles with Matt Riddle was, as the bros are waits, which was a fucking good time. Got canceled because of the, um, you know, scandemic and all that shit with Pete Dunne being stuck in the UK, and Matt Riddle had to lose the titles with after his playing part, his, um, t- his, uh, what is it, his substitute partner, um, um, Timothy Thatcher turned on him, but that's not him over there. And here he is now with a shitty name, with a shitty gimmick, and you can already tell he doesn't even want to be here. Moving on here, Kevin Owens. We see the video package of Kevin Owens um, and everything, and then we see what happened with Steve Austin's response, and it's like, I'm thinking, I'm looking at this, and I'm like, this is just sad. WWE has WrestleMania in one of the biggest stadiums in, in America. No, it's not the, probably the I don't think it's the biggest stadium in the world, but it's the biggest one of the biggest stadiums, if not the biggest stadium in America. And it hold, can hold up to one hundred thousand people, and they want to try and sell this thing up for one hundred thousand two nights in a row. Which, if they don't, they're still going to say that there's one hundred thousand each night, which is going to be a fucking lie. And WrestleTix will prove that. Anyway, they're trying to sell this thing out. If you look at the card, it's atrocious. <laughs> Sami Zayn versus Johnny Knoxville. Logan Paul in the Miz versus the Mysterios. Drew McIntyre versus Aaron Corbin. You know, Drew McIntyre, who back to back years wrestled for the WWE Championship, and the year before that, in 2019, he wrestled Roman Reigns. Three big matches on the big show. And now he is reduced to feuding with Aaron Corbin. The women's tag team titles are on the line in the triple threat match, which will probably become a fatal four-way before we get there, probably with the Bella Twins added, because it's either the Bella Twins are going to be in that match, or they're going to do the same thing they did to Bailey to somebody else and bury a, a, a younger talent who doesn't, need, who doesn't deserve to be buried. Outside of Edge versus AJ Styles and Roman Reigns versus um, Brock Lesnar, even though Ed, Roman Reigns versus Brock Lesnar, we have seen... Ten times at least. It's a unification match. Will they stick to the unification thing? Probably not. What you should do is unify those two titles, keep the WWE title on Roman Reigns on SmackDown, and come out with a new title on Raw with the Universal title being retired as Roman Reigns being the greatest Universal Champion in history. Plain and simple. But, WWE is so desperate to get tickets sold that they have to go and get a man who hasn't been a wrestler in 19 years and have pretty much got on his hand, their hands and knees and like, oh, please don't go. Please come back and wrestle Kevin Owens. We need you. We need your star power, the little star power you still have. We need it because we can't book and we can't build new stars because our fucking booking sucks. Please come back and wrestle Kevin Owens. Please. Stone Cold was like, oh, hell no. I ain't coming back to wrestle Stone Cold. I ain't, Stone Cold Steve Austin ain't coming back to wrestle Kevin Owens. I'll do a Kevin Owens show and beat the shit out of this guy, but I ain't coming back to wrestle for your bitch ass. He was on his podcast and said, if you really wanted to, if you, like, if you really thought, thought of doing this, you should have given Stone Cold Steve Austin the keys to the car and let him choose his own opponent. Don't go out there and pick somebody for him. I'm sure he doesn't have a tr- have a problem with Kevin Owens. I mean, he gifted Kevin Owens and okayed him using the Stone Cold Stunner as a finisher when Stone when Kevin Owens wanted to be a babyface. They wanted to have a babyface recognizable sh- finish. But yet here is Stone Cold Steve Austin telling WWE that no, I am not gonna waste my legacy and hurt my credibility to come back and save your asses with a match. If you want me at WrestleMania, it's going to have to be like that. is isn't going to happen. And I respect Stone Cold for that. Other talent like Shawn Michaels, he, he, he did it for years, but then eventually he was like, yeah, you know, I'm going to come back. 
I'm going to come back and wrestle one shitty match and then move on with my life. I'm, I'm happy that he's not coming back to this match. I'm happy the fact that it's only going to be something like, oh, I don't know, a back and forth thing, which is going to end up leading to a fight. Stone Cold is going to stun him in the end, and that's going to be it. So it's just sad. If WWE didn't know, I don't know, didn't fire Keith Lee, didn't fire Karrion Cross, didn't fire John Morrison, didn't fire half the fucking locker room, and actually took their time, and actually gave them good material, and built them up to actually feel like they meant something, you wouldn't have to rely on a Stone Cold Steve Austin, Ronda Drowsy, or, or um, Brock Lesnar for WrestleMania, the most stupendous they say i'm more like the most stupid wrestlemania you know what people say wrestlemania 9 is the worst wrestlemania in history and i would give them that for the error but at least in wrestlemania 9 they tried they went out there and they tried to book the best they could you had Shawn michaels versus tataka that was a pretty good match you had the Hulk, uh, the hulk maniacs with hulk hogan and brutus the barber beefcake versus money inc that match was okay too, even though it went to a shit finish. Just so many things that they did on that show, they at least tried and only had what they had to deal with. They didn't have the most one of the most talented rosters at one time under their umbrella. Back in 1993, you had Razor, you had Sting, you had you had Razor, you had Sean, you had Brett. If you would have had, and that's another thing that why people give so much hate to WrestleMania Night. If Hulk Hogan doesn't beat Bret Hart in the, in the, in the end of that show in a in the most sabotageable way possible, to hurt the generate the, as they are, it definitely wouldn't have been. It probably would be seen as not as bad. It's it definitely takes a bad rap because of that. Yeah, a lot of the show was not good, but at least back then they they had an excuse that's like yeah they they had to make do with what they got. There was no reason. If you had spent the last year not firing Karrion Cross, put it in, putting him in a fucking Ninja Turtle Shredder-esque attire, making T- Keith Lee be Bearcat Keith Lee, you actually would have taken your time and gave these guys the right material, let them go out there and be who they are, be who they were in NXT, and actually built your company up. And built these talents to something that actually felt like they fucking matter. Then you wouldn't be in the position that you're in. You wouldn't have to go to Stone Cold Steve Austin and beg him. I'm surprised they didn't bring Goldberg back for a match. But no. They're going to sit here and do everything they can to get as many tickets sold. And it's just not going to fucking work. This company... Needs to fail. A lot of things. They're not selling out Dallas two nights in a row. It's just not going to happen. They're going to have been a rude awakening for Stand in the Liver. When Stand in the Liver doesn't sell shit. Because nobody gives a fuck about NXT right now. Because you took what Triple H built up and killed it. And the fact that you have some balls to put Stand in the Liver on at 1 o'clock Eastern Time... Ten, noon Pacific, noon Central Time, when Game Changer Wrestling, Ring of Honor, well, not Ring of Honor, but like Game Changer Wrestling and other companies are going to be having their big shows this weekend, that weekend. People are going to go and watch those shows. Those shows, because those shows, you're going to get quality wrestling. You're going to get quality storytelling, maybe. I don't know. I don't watch much independent wrestling. You're going to get things that you actually care about. We're in NXT. They're trying to sell. Stand and deliver on Dolph Ziggler versus Braun Breaker. Dolph Ziggler, I have no problem with Braun Breaker. What I've seen from him, he's not bad at all. Dolph Ziggler is not somebody you try and sell your show on. You would have had a better chance of putting AJ Styles in that position, but no, you have him doing something at WrestleMania against Edge, and you can't have him stretch too thin. Dolph Ziggler's not doing anything. So yeah. WWE having to go out of their way to try and get that real old crusty cookie of Stone Cold Steve Austin. That's stale cookie. And try and 
get it to you guys as a sweet treat just because they can't book talent to mean anything. Outside of Roman Reigns and Brock Lesnar, nobody fucking feels special. Nobody fucking matters. And that is Vince McMahon and Bruce Prichard and everyone who kisses their asses fault. Fuck Vince McMahon, fuck Bruce Prichard, and fuck everybody who kisses their ass. It's high time somebody went in there and said, Vince, get your head out of your ass. Start booking your talent to actually mean something instead of having to rely on Goldberg and Steve Austin and The Rock and The Undertaker and everybody else. Give me a break. We get a video back to shows how Sami Zayn dropped the Intercontinental title of Ricochet last week thanks to Johnny Knoxville. In the back, Caleb Braxton is backstage with Sami. He's not happy with how he was. she introduced him as former champion, even though that's what he is. He has a lot of this mind tonight. She shows us a Team MZ video of Johnny Knoxville flying Sammy's phone number over Los Angeles on the back of a plane. So apparently, on Thursday, Sammy Zane somehow got a hold of Johnny Knoxville's ta- um, um, cell phone. And decided that he was going to harass this guy using his actual cell phone. Please tell me he wasn't this stupid. Please tell me this is all just... He's got a working a, a workman's phone because if that was his actual real life phone number, that's all on Sammy. If I got somebody's phone number and I wanted to make their life a living hell by just you know tweeting the fuck out of them or messaging the fuck out of them, calling them up like when they're in the middle of sleeping or in the middle of a show or while they're in the middle of intercourse or something like that, I wouldn't be using a phone that could be traced. I'd be using a burner phone. But apparently. Again, I don't know if it's his actual phone number or not, but if it is, that's on Sami Zayn. This is what you get, Sammy. You get what you deserve. Just saying. So, apparently he's had over 1,100 texts and calls hit his phone, which, again, I know he showed a picture on social media, like, blacking out the last four digits of every number, which is so stupid, he should have blacked out all the numbers. And he just showed us, like, these text messages and phone numbers, and I'm like... Please tell me this is not his real number, because if this is his real number, he's a fucking moron. He's not happy. He hasn't been able to prepare for tonight's match. He says he... His phone has been blowing up all day, so he has zero preparation. He says he's not worried because he's learned that he can overcome what is thrown in him no matter what, just like WWE management conspired against him, but still won his Intercontinental title. By the way, we, we are starting to go towards the Sami Zayn talking about conspiracies, and the faker is going to be talking about conspiracies when she lose, hopefully loses on Friday, on Wednesday. Both companies doing conspiracy fucking angles. Can we stop with this shit? Conspiracy angles get so outplayed and so stretched out and they get so annoying. Can we stop with that? He says he's going to win the title back because Johnny Knoxville is not here. So bad at WrestleMania, he'll be going to Sami Zayn for the Intercontinental title instead. Gosh, I hope not. Just saying. Drew McIntyre and the Viking Raiders were supposed to take on Happy Corbin, um, Baron Corbin, Man, Cat Moss, and Jinder Mahal. But before that could happen... We get a 2K22 promo. I've seen the videos footage of it. It does look a lot better graphically wise, but it still has the same problems as before. How the fuck can 2K continue to fuck this game up? I don't even know. Back from break, McIntyre waits in the ring, but the Viking Raiders get beat up backstage by Jinder Mahal, Shanky, Moss, and Corbin. They come out, they beat up on Drew McIntyre. But Drew McIntyre fights everybody off and takes out everybody. So we got no match in just a segment of... Drew beating up everybody and Corbin and him staring down. La, 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 la. Here comes the most cure, the biggest cure from insomnia, for insomnia in WWE. Ron the Jowsy. She comes to the ring and comes out to a pop. She marches to the ring, greets the fans. Back from break, she has a brief Women's History Month video on Hall of Fame and Leader. Good for her. I don't care. She says, Flair revealed her crafting ignorance last week when she called her a one-trick pony with an armbar. She says where Flair sees one armbar, she sees thousands of ways to get there. She talks about how she's been refining her ankle locks she's learned from her first mentor in this ring, Hall of Famer Kurt Angle. I guess um, your friend Natalia wasn't your mentor, the fact that she helped you train to wrestle? I guess not. And she thinks don't think of no better way than to thank Kurt than to tap Flair out with that at WrestleMania. Out comes Charlotte, makes her way to the ring. Stops at the entrance pose at the pyro because that's what WWE wants to do. You have to always pose or dance or show everything off instead of, you know, just coming to the ring. She points out at WrestleMania sign and says the match will be the biggest fight of Rousey's life. 
accused as Rousey of taking advantage of her last week because she had shoes on, like heel, 12 inch heels, and a business suit, because that has anything to do with your fucking ankles and you tapping out like a little bitch. She should be less concerned of honoring her mentor and more with winning on the biggest stage. But I promise she won't be tapping her around and won't be tapping her out. Rousey says she's already, she already has, and we'll do it again. Blair goes on to talking trash and promises to embarrass and humiliate Rousey and to make her tap out by the end of the night at WrestleMania. Rousey would love to see her that. She'll even give Flair time to take off her heels. Flair goes to take off, goes to look like she's going to take off her heels. She gets out of the ring and says, uh-oh, uh-oh, as the fans chant, you tapped out. She says she wants to be champion. Rousey says, Flair can't just walk away at WrestleMania. She promises to leave WrestleMania with Flair's title or and her arm or she's going to tap out. I literally was fighting sleep in this entire segment. I could very care less. This is your main event of WrestleMania Night 2. This is not a WrestleMania worthy main event match. AJ Styles versus, um, versus Edge gives them a championship and put it on the first, first night as a main event. This is not a main event worthy match. Period. We see what happened earlier today with Paul Heyman champion Bre um, Brock Lesnar. Naomi and Sasha Banks versus Shayna Baszler and Natalya. I thought, oh great, here we go. Wait for Shayna Baszler and Natalya to get into that title match, but no. Match lasted about maybe three minutes. Sasha Banks and Naomi win, as they should. You see the Deucers attack Shinsuke Nakamura and Rick Boogs last week. They retaliated with, over the Viking Raiders and retained over the Viking Raiders last week. Out come the Usos, and I'm thinking, oh, wait a minute, this is perfect for Brock Lesnar. They said Brock Lesnar has left the building. What's, gonna, what's to say Brock Lesnar comes back and murders both of these guys for blood for blood and takes it out on them to leave them laying for their cousin? But that didn't happen because Brock Lesnar apparently did leave because Brock Lesnar doesn't stay, doesn't, he doesn't get paid by the hour. He comes, he does his segment, and he goes. That's typical. Usos take the mic, they brag about their title reign, say their management no one, found them no, worthy, no one worthy for us right now because they are the ones. Out comes Nakamura and Boogs. Boogs makes it known that they want the title shot. The Usos can't believe Boogs and Nakamura want to challenge them at WrestleMania. The Usos say, well, Boogs, you know, with your one leg wrap, if you can beat Jay, then you can have a title shot. So, we have the match. Now, immediately Jay goes to the right leg. Referees back him off. Boogs. Starts on lapping his leg, does a big stomp, and is like, ha-ha, gotcha, bitch. Long story short, Wick Boogs picks up the win, and before he can really celebrate, he does point at WrestleMania. Jimmy takes his guitar and whacks him in the back of the head. Nakamura comes in to check on Boogs as those guys leave, and he points to WrestleMania while staring down the Usos. So there is your tag team title match for SmackDown. Boogs and Nakamura versus the Usos at WrestleMania. Good on them. Don't really care. It's like, I would rather have seen the RK Bros versus the Usos for the unification of the tag team titles, but it is what it is. In the Cardinal title match, Sami Zayn versus Ricochet, and I was like, oh god, are we really going to do this? Is there quite a possibility that WWE is going to swerve us, no pun intended, swerve us, and have Sami Zayn, after losing the title last week, beat Ricochet this week, and still get to Johnny Knoxville versus Sami Zayn for the Intercontinental title at WrestleMania. Thankfully, that did not happen. It was a fine match. Ricochet, of course, retains the championship. Sami Zayn tried every dirty trick in the book. Gets, eats the ripcord. The record, I'm sorry. I keep calling it the ripcord, and I don't know why. The recoil, um, pretty much the code, but one legged code breaker. Rick, Rick, um, Ricochet hits the 630, 1, 2, 3, and he retains his championship. Celebrates. That should be how SmackDown goes off the air. However, unfortunately, we have to go backstage to where Rousey and Starbot 9000 are blowing, brawling all over the place. And I'm thinking, oh God, we're doing this again. Are they going to need the cops called on them again, like two years ago? They fight for a bit. Pat Buck gets hit in the face. Adam Pierce gets shot. I believe it was Adam Pierce. They climb up like she, like she slams Drowsy on top of the tarp thing, picks her up, and starts ch like choking her out. As Flair is yelling at the officials in the background, SmackDown goes off the air with something that I don't think anybody should really give a shit about. 
Rampage was fine. It was decent. I mean, live is always better. Tape just doesn't feel as great. SmackDown was, after Brock Lesnar, an absolute shit show with the fact that Pete Dunne is now being killed. On, like his, his main roster career is dead already. There is nothing. There is no chance in hell this dude gets over being, calling, being called that. No chance in hell you see him as a future Intercontinental Champion, future Tag Team Champion, or future World Champion with that name. He is just going to be a mid-carder who, puts, who gets puts, ends up putting other people over until... John Will and I just calls up and said, Yeah, bud, uh, we have to cut you because uh, budget cuts. Uh, enjoy your day. That's going to happen after WrestleMania. The laundry, the, 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 the cleaning out their laundry list of talent they didn't cut last year is going to happen this year. Pete Dunn, Roderick Strong. Um, Pete Dunn, Roderick Strong, Zia Lee, Dante Blackheart are all going to be cut at least. I'm calling it now. Those four, Apollo Crews as well, those five are going to be cut by the, uh, by the time we go, start doing the spring cleaning. And we have probably more talent, mostly in NXT, mostly on the main roster, cut. This company fucking sucks. Fuck Vince McMahon. Fuck Bruce Pritchard. That's all you can say about that. Hit that subscribe button. Comment down below. Like or dislike this video. Find me on Minds at the France Club. Find me on Twitch.tv slash the France Club. And find me on Instagram at the France Club. And I will see you guys on Monday. Overall, until then, my name is the France, and I'll see you guys later.